Hey everyone, Kevin P. McAuliffe here for Assimilate Inc. and I'm back again with another Scratch tutorial. And in this lesson, we're talking basic conforming. We've talked about a very basic dailies workflow. Now the next logical thing that you might want to do, especially if you're getting started in Scratch, is to take a timeline from your nonlinear editing application and bring it into Scratch to start playing around with. So in this lesson, I'm going to give you a basic introduction on taking an AAF file from an Avid Media Composer, bringing it in, and some of the problems you might run into when you're just getting started. All right, now the first thing I want to do is I want to draw your attention down here to almost the lower left-hand corner of the Scratch interface to our conform parameters. You'll see we have the ability to conform an EDL, an AAF, an XML, or an ALE. Now when I was prepping this lesson, I think that the AAF file might be tagged as an UHD or as a UHD timeline. So what I'm going to do is just jump down to the render module here. I'm just going to set this to be 23976 frames per second at 1080p. I might have to change that, but we'll get back to that in just a second. Now, like I was saying, you'll see that we have the option to get in and to conform an EDL, AAF, XML, or an ALE or Avid Log Exchange file. So what we're going to do is we're going to say import. Now I'm going to navigate to my desktop and I'm going to select the montage.aaf. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come down and I'm going to say open. Now I'm going to be honest with you. This conform window is probably one of the coolest windows that I've worked with across any nonlinear editing application in my 20 some odd years of conforming shows. It's a very intuitive interface that is going to give you a ton of power over getting in and getting the correct shots that you need in your conform. Now, before we go on, I want to point something out. And, you know, a lot of these uh, parameters and things that we get into, we go into in quite a bit of detail. There's some that we go into in some detail and some that, to be honest, I just, for the sake of time, I just don't have time to go into. But what I encourage you to do is to head to assimilatesupport.com, head over to that search window, punch in any of the parameters you want to learn more information about, hit enter, and you can take your time to go as in-depth into Scratch as you want. All right. Now, let's talk about ways to get media into our conform so that we'll see them appear in our timeline. Now, this is one that is very cool, and I'm actually going to talk about project first before I talk about folder. Project is a very cool one. So here's the situation. So you have come to me as a post host, and you've said, Kev, we need you to create some dailies from our 8K media. And I say, sure, no problem. So I take that 8K media, I put it into 10 different timelines for 10 different cards. I create the dailies for you. I send them off. You come back to me six months later. You say, Kev, we're now ready to conform. Oh, by the way, you already have all the 8K footage, so we're just going to send you our AAF. So what I'm going to do is make sure that Scratch is going to know that in the current project that we're working in, I'm going to want it to look there for the media. Now, I can be as specific as I want as to where Scratch is going to look for this media. What I can do is I can tell Scratch that I want it to look in the timeline, inside of the group, or inside of the project. Now, obviously, this is going to vary based on whether I know where the media is or not. If I happen to know that all the media is located in one timeline, I'm going to direct it to that one timeline. If I happen to have 20 different timelines, I'm going to select the group and then let Scratch go through all the timelines located inside of that group. What if I have 50 groups with 50 timelines in each group? Well, to be honest, then I'm just going to have Scratch go through the project. All right. Now, in this case, this was coming from an Avid Media Composer. I didn't create any dailies, so what I'm going to want to do is search by folder. Now, right now, you'll see that Scratch is going to search by the time code and the clip name. And what I'm going to do, again, is just be as generic or as specific as I want to be as to where this media is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come into the footage folder. I'm going to select Art Beats, and I'm going to say Select. Now, right down here, you'll see that we're going to create a new timeline, and I'm just going to call this Kevin's Montage. All right, and I'm simply going to say Assemble. All right, now once I say yes, you'll see that something's happened. We have some thumbnails here, but all of our media is actually offline. So what exactly is going on here? Well, you might think that what you now need to do is to come over here and what we're going to do is we're simply going to delete this. We're going to go back. We're going to import it again, et cetera, et cetera. No, too much work. All right. What we're going to do is simply come down and we're going to edit our conform. So we're basically going to step right back into the conform window. 
And what I need to do is I actually need to select the clips that I would like Scratch to look for and tell Scratch to go look for them. Now, before we do that, I just want to point out that you'll notice that each event, which an event could be, it could be a clip, it could be an effect, it could really be just about anything associated with this AAF file is listed here in order. Now, this spatial adapter, to be quite honest, I don't even really need, and it's not actually really relevant, so I don't care if Scratch skips over this or not. This was just something that was dropped onto this clip that happened to be in my timeline in Media Composer that's really just a frame flex option, all right? Really, the only thing that matters to me is the dissolves and the actual clips themselves. But since we're searching for media, and I normally do this sort of force of habit, I select all the clips, I don't actually even need to do that. Why? Because right down here, you'll notice that we have a start matching, and right beside that, it says all. So since I have all selected, you don't need to select all inside the actual conform window, but it's okay. I'll leave it the way it is for now. All I now need to do is to simply come down and click on start matching. Once I click that, obviously depending on how many clips are in your EDL, I can now simply select one of the clips. You'll see there's the giraffe right there. I can now come down, simply say assemble, and we now have all the media associated with this timeline. Now you'll see it did give us a new timeline, which is no problem. I can simply say delete. There we go. So there is our new timeline all set to go. Now let me show you a very common problem that you might run into. And what I'm going to do is just delete this timeline here. Let's just delete that. Let's come in. Let's edit that EDL or that AAF file. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of be a little bit generic as to where I want Scratch to look for that media. I'm going to select the root level of my media drive. And what I'm now going to do is tell Scratch to start looking. Now, obviously, based on how much stuff you have on your hard drive, this could take, well, seconds like you just saw, or this could conceivably take minutes and minutes and minutes, you know, if you're dealing with terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of footage. But now take a look at what's happened. We kind of are in a little bit of a catch-22 here. Because as great as the idea is of just having a clip called, for example, clip one, I want you to imagine how many clips on your hard drive right now are called clip one or are called, you know, uh, giraffe walking. If you're doing a shoot in Africa, you might have a thousand clips called giraffe walking. And if you don't know exactly what clip it is that you need, you can run into problems very quickly. Here's what I mean by that. I'm going to select the very first clip, and by searching the entire hard drive on my system, you'll notice that we now actually have four giraffe clips. So what the heck is going on here? Well, what is going on here is that I actually have three pieces of Avid Media that I've imported into different projects of this giraffe that you'll notice are actually called something slightly different, except for the fact that T240-08H is actually the first characters in the name of this file, which is why Scratch has tagged them as potential media clips for us to work with. Now, here's where things get dangerous. If you're not paying attention to what you're doing and you had everything set up like this, you might be thinking, this is fantastic. I'm all set to go. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to assemble this and look, perfect, there's all my media, except for one problem. If you actually take a look at the clip itself, you'll see the clip name down here at the bottom. This is one of the clips that came from my Avid Media Files folder. If I'm not paying attention, this clip could very well be a DNX HD 36 file and not an AK file that I actually need to work with. So again, this is why paying attention to what you're doing is exceptionally important, okay? Again, I'm just gonna delete this timeline here. Let's just delete. Okay. And you'll see that my timeline here, actually, when I brought it in, had switched back to UHD. So we'll switch that in just a second. So let's come back. Let's edit this conform. What I'm going to do here, again, is I'm just going to search for everything. I'm going to select all, start matching. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to head up to one of these clips and I'm going to select it again. You'll see that right now the clip that is at the very most bottom is the clip that was actually in my timeline. So therefore, if I select this clip of the giraffe and I position it at the very bottom most layer inside of the matching clips window, or basically at the bottom of the stack, this is now going to be the clip that's selected. Now, I'm just going to go through and do it with a couple clips here just so that you can see how this works. We'll do one more here. All right, we've got a lot of birds. Where is my bird in here? There we go. Very nice. I'm going to put that at the bottom. And if I wanted to, I could actually come in and remove some of these as well 
if I know exactly the clip that I'm going to be working with. But again, once we have everything all set to go, all I'm going to do is simply say assemble. You'll see there's the proper clips in my timeline and we're now all set to go. Now, what I'm going to do now, since I'm not going to be going back into the conform window and you'll see that this timeline has been tagged as again UHD, I'm just going to switch that back here. I probably should have set that correctly in Media Composer when I created the AAF, but it's all good. Now, there is something else that I want to point out to you. We haven't really talked too much about slots up until this point, but I think it's important to talk a little bit more about them now. This is one thing I love about these lessons is that, you know, we might have a lesson specifically on slots, but in other lessons like conforming, we might deal with a different aspect of slots that's going to give you just a little bit more of an in-depth appreciation for exactly how they work. All right. So up until this point, we know that slots hold clips and each one of these slots represents a clip that's in my timeline. However, if you take a look at what's going on with my timeline here, you'll see that with this clip here, and what I should actually do, you'll notice, and I believe it's this one here. Let me just head to my framing. If I reposition this, because it's kind of bugging me a little bit. I'm not sure if, let's just come all the way back here. I just want to reposition this just so that we can get it to fit properly here. I'm just going to zoom in on it just because it's bugging me. There we go. All right. So you'll see that this fades into the shot of Central Park. And what we actually have happening here is that this is kind of a cool shot of Central Park. But if we go back to the construct window, you'll notice that the shot of Central Park is not there. Only that shot of, and I'm not going to say it's the, the Brooklyn Bridge. I'm not sure which bridge this is in New York. So we're just going to call it the New York Bridge. Uh, we have our bridge shot. But again, I don't have my Central Park shot. Now, what's important to keep in mind about the slots is the slots are not only designed to hold media, but they're also designed to hold other elements like versions. Now, what do I mean by a version? Well, we're going to talk about versions in their own dedicated lesson or lessons in a little while. But at their most fundamental, what a version is, is that when you get in and start creating your grades, you might have two, three, four, ten, fifteen 10, 15 different grades or looks or versions that are going to be contained inside of a slot. This is how you're now able to manage exactly what's going on with a specific shot and its grades. They're going to be contained within the slot. Now, again, like I just said, you'll notice that the Central Park shot doesn't have a slot. Or does it? If I head back to the construct module and you take a look over here on the left in the project hierarchy, you'll notice that my montage is right here. However, attached to that montage, I have something called V2. And if I click on V2, there's the shot of Central Park in a slot ready for me to get in and do any type of grading or work that I might need to do with it. Now, keep in mind, if I happen to have multiple different video tracks all the way up to, you know, however many I might need, if I had eight of them, I would see eight different tracks located in here that I could easily switch back and forth between. All right, so this has just been a very introductory look at conforming, and we're going to talk more about conforming as we go along, possibly in their own dedicated lesson or as little bits and pieces in parts of other lessons. So I hope this has given you the knowledge now to take sequences from your nonlinear editing application, hop into Scratch so that you can start playing around and follow along with our lessons. All right, I want to thank you for watching this great lesson on learning Assimilate Scratch. Now, don't forget to check us out on our different social channels. And if you missed our last lesson, you can simply click on it right here on the screen in front of you. Don't forget as well to hit that subscribe button. And if you have any questions, you can always send them to me at kevinpmcauliffe at gmail.com.